Today we're going to talk about angular momentum and the law of conservation of angular momentum. So what is angular momentum? Well we know it's going to parallel linear momentum and linear momentum was given by this equation here. The linear momentum was equal to the mass of an object times the velocity of the object. And it was a vector. The momentum pointed in the same direction as the velocity. And we said it was a measure of how difficult it is to stop an object. So it's hard to stop objects that have lots of mass and lots of speed. For angular momentum, we're going to use the letter L. It too is going to be a vector. The rotational equivalent of mass is rotational inertia. And the rotational equivalent of velocity is angular velocity. And it turns out angular velocity has a direction. And that direction works very much the same as our right hand rule when we studied magnetism. Remember, if we had a current that was circling around like so, then we'd get a magnetic field that pointed perpendicular to the plane of that circle. So now if we've got something that's rotating around in a circle or spinning around in a circle, then that rotation will form a plane. And the angular velocity here would point in a direction perpendicular to that plane. And angular momentum is going to be a measure of how difficult it is to stop an object from rotating. So naturally it's going to be harder to stop an object if its rate of rotation is very fast and it's also going to be hard to stop an object from rotating if it's got a lot of mass and that mass is concentrated far from the axis of rotation. If you've ever used an orbital sander, then it's likely that you've experienced the effect of angular momentum. A few summers ago, I was sanding my deck with an orbital sander. And so I was sanding on the bottom surface of the deck, and then I changed and started sanding on the sides of the deck. And the orbital sander seemed to twist out of my hand. It was much more difficult to change the orientation of the sander when it was spinning than when it wasn't. And that's because originally the angular momentum, the angular velocity, would be pointing in this direction. And then you've got to change the angular momentum to another direction. So you have to apply a torque to change the angular momentum vector. And that makes it much more difficult to do and causes some unusual twisting that wouldn't be present if the sander was not rotating. Now, if there's an angular momentum, there must be a law of conservation of angular momentum. And once again, it's going to directly parallel our law of conservation of linear momentum. So you'll recall the law of conservation of linear momentum said that if there's no external force acting on a system, then the momentum of that system is constant. Now, all we need to do to write the law of conservation of angular momentum is put this in angular terms. If no net now, of course, we have to change to that rotational force, torque, if no net torque acts on a system. The, not linear momentum, but angular momentum of that system will be constant. So let's see how that works in action. I often take my daughter to the local park, and we play on something that I, I usually call a merry-go-round stick. But what happens is Cecilia will grab onto this pole here and stand on this rotating platform. And then I'll stand over here. And I'll give a little push with my foot. And then I'll put my foot on the rotating platform. And I'll lean back as far as I can. And we'll rotate fairly slowly. But then I'll pull my arms in. And it's actually quite hard to pull your arms in. But I'll pull my arms in, and what will happen is the rate of rotation increases dramatically. And we spin around like crazy. So let's see how the law of conservation momentum applies to this. When I was leaning out a long ways, 
the mass was concentrated farther from the axis of rotation. So before we started the fast spin, I had a big moment of inertia. But we are rotating fairly slowly. But after I pulled my hands in, and remember here, there's no torque on the system once I give that initial push with my foot. There's no external forces making us rotate. We're just rotating because of that angular momentum. So when I bring my body in close to the axis of rotation, of course that greatly reduces my angular momentum. But the angular momentum of the system is supposed to remain constant because there's no torque acting. So that angular momentum before will equal the angular momentum afterwards. And that can only be done if we have a, a much bigger angular velocity. And that can only be true if I have a much bigger spin right here. And that's why we end up spinning so quickly at the end. Here's a nice little cartoon by Paul Hewitt illustrating this idea. So the man's standing on a rotating platform. So there would have been a torque on him to get him rotating, but there doesn't need to be a torque on him to keep him rotating because of his angular momentum. So that's the first thing to realize. No torque. Second thing to realize is that the angular momentum before should equal the angular momentum after if there is no torque. Before, we've got the mass a long ways from the axis of rotation. And that means you're going to have a big rotational inertia. And then you'll have some spin rate or angular velocity. When he brings the mass much closer to the axis of rotation, that of course greatly decreases his rotational inertia. And when that happens, in order to keep the same overall angular momentum, we have to have a greatly increased spin rate. So this is naturally what figure skaters do in order to go into those very tight, very fast spins. Now I have a short clip here showing Natalia Kanunikova setting a world record for the spin rate of a figure skater. Watch it through and then pause the video and discuss the physics behind the high spin rate. Okay, pause the video and discuss the physics. What I've done is taken a little bit of data from Kanunikova's spin. So we know her final spin rate, her world record spin rate, was 308 spins per minute. And by looking at frames, what I did is I measured how much time her first spin took, 0 0.86 seconds. And what we're going to do is make a little assumption. We're going to assume she's kind of like a spinning rod. The length of that rod will be 30 centimeters long. So that rod is spinning about an axis through the center of her body. And it has a mass equal to her mass, which is 50 kilograms. So pause the video and see if you can work out the final and initial rotational inertia of Natalia Kanunikova. Let's begin by calculating her final rotational inertia. And we're making the assumption here that she is a rod-like. And if we look it up, the rotational inertia of a rod about its center is 1 12th the mass times the length of the rod squared. So it's 1 12th, her mass is 50 kilograms, and the effective length of the rod, the length of her torso, is 30 centimeters or 0 0.3 meters. And we square that, we should get that her final rotational inertia is equal to 0 0.375 kilograms times meters squared. So that's step one. Step two, what we're going to do is calculate her initial rotational spin rate in revolutions per minute. So we know her period, it takes 0 0.86 seconds for one revolution. Of course, the frequency is just one over the period. And if you carry that out, you'll get 1.16 revolutions 
every second. Now we want to convert that to revolutions per minute because we want to have the same units as our final spin rate, which was 308 spins per minute. So we're going to do a conversion, convert the seconds two minutes, and there's 60 seconds in one minute. So we're effectively multiplying by 60. Work that out and you should get 70 revolutions every minute. Now for the third step, what we're going to do is use the law of conservation of angular momentum. The angular momentum before initially has to equal the angular momentum afterwards. So initially she had that large moment of inertia, but she was rotating very slowly. Afterwards, she has a small rotational inertia, but she's rotating really quickly. And we determined what that final rotational inertia was. It was 0 0.375. And we also know the two rotation rates in revolutions per minute. And as long as we've got the same units, it doesn't matter whether we use an official angular velocity in radians per second, or we just use revolutions per minute. So as long as we're consistent with our units on both sides of the equation, it's all going to work out. So our final spin rate was 308. Our initial spin rate was 70. And that means we should be able to work out this large initial moment of inertia. And I'll let you do that. It should come out to be 1.65 kilograms times meters squared. Now just to show you what's going on there, I've taken two frames from her initial rotation. And what I'm going to do is superimpose them together. I'll try to get the two stanchions lined up there and the boards lined up. Right about there. So her center of mass, which is located kind of close to your belly button, you can see in the photo that that center of mass is a long way from the axis of rotation. It'll be somewhere over 20 centimeters from the axis of rotation. So what she's really doing with her body, she's stretching it out so the mass is as far away as possible from the axis of rotation, thus greatly increasing her moment of inertia. Let's summarize the big ideas from the video. So the first one was we define this angular momentum stuff as being a vector and it's equal to the rotational inertia times the angular velocity vector. And that led us to the law of conservation of angular momentum, which simply said that if the sum of the torques was zero, L would be constant. And that led us to a fairly simple type of problem that we could solve where we had a system that was rotating without any torques on it, such as a figure skater. And we would simply say that the angular momentum before had to equal the angular momentum afterwards, at any time afterwards. And so that, and so if we had a really big moment of inertia before, we'd get a small rotational rate. And then afterwards, say we had a small moment of inertia, then of course we'd get a large rotational rate such that the angular momentum would always remain constant. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.